uh, ooh, come to our attention. Now, obviously, we have a, a legal responsibility to investigate any concerns <clears throat> about doctors um, fitness to practice that come to our attention. So just give you a little like, a flavor of the type of issues uh, that <clears throat> I suppose would uh, would go through our processes and be, be investigated. Um, give you a little flavor of the process itself. I don't want to get too bogged down in the process because it's quite complex and, <laughs> and could, we could be here all day talking about that. <clears throat> but very, very importantly, um, I'll also tell you about the support that is available to doctors involved in a, um, a fitness to practice investigation, either locally in their own trust or indeed at the GMC, because, um, you know, the my opening comment, and I hope you appreciate this, is that we're very aware that uh, any doctor involved in a fitness to practice investigation, whether it's local or at the GMC, <clears throat> that's an incredibly uh, stressful and worrying place for that doctor to be uh, and we acknowledge that uh, so I'll, I'm going to be sharing some statistics and data with you because uh, we have a lot of data on this but behind every datum there's there's an individual there's a doctor there's a family there's a patient uh, so I'm very aware about that so I'm not I'm not being glib at all about these uh, these these issues so it's it's a very serious issue that we're talking about so hopefully you'll appreciate that as we go through just a little bit about me and the team I work in, just to introduce myself a little bit more. I've been at the GMC for ooh, 11 years now. Used to work in the NHS myself. In those of you with good memories will remember primary care trusts, uh, now ICBs. Um, so I was involved on the commissioning side of the NHS uh, uh, near where I live, uh, in because uh, I live in Brighton and Hove, which is where I'm speaking to you from now. <clears throat> so on the map there, you can see I'm part of a team that covers the, the whole of the UK, uh, called the Outreach Team, set up about 11 years ago when I joined the GMC. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and our job is to uh, really to create that regional presence for the GMC in our regions, <clears throat> to engage with all elements of the healthcare system in our regions <clears throat> to support doctors and medical students. So I have two medical stu uh, schools in my patch, Brighton and Kent, <clears throat> uh, to give them the information they need to, to be the best doctor there and medical student they possibly can be. So it's very much a supportive role. <clears throat> the jargon term is upstream regulation. That's the, the jargon we use. So <clears throat> the more engagement we can have like this with doctors like your good selves and 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 all, all grades of doctors, all specialties of doctors, uh, the more engagement we have like this, the more information we can give you, the more knowledge you get, uh, then obviously uh, the less likely it is that uh, there'll be any fitness to practice issues down the line. And, and the figures bear that out, and I'll share some of those with you uh, as we go along. <clears throat> so I'm based down in Brighton and Hove, as I said. My patch is Kent, Surrey and Sussex. So very, very happy to be speaking to, uh, to you all this morning. Uh, and you may well find me, uh, if you know, depending on where you work in the, in the particular trust, you may have seen me coming into the trust in the past, or you might see me coming into your trust in the future, because I do a lot of work, uh, certainly in Medway and, and East Kent hospitals as well. So uh, uh, that's that's our our team, uh, as I say, uh, set up to really, really change the way the GMC engages with uh, registrants and uh, medical students. That's me. I don't always show myself in my slides. I have to be honest, my ego isn't that fragile. I need to show myself. <clears throat> this is just a stock image from uh, from the GM uh, from the sort of GMC library, if you like. Uh, this is me talking with a bunch of uh, a group of doctors who've just come to the UK from uh, overseas. Um, we, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about this as we go along. But we run this program called Welcome to UK Practice. We've been running it for about 10 years now. And it's a half day workshop where doctors, these doctors, some of them literally will have been in the UK for a couple of days. Uh, and so we, we run a workshop to really give doctors the information they need to get used to working in the NHS, to get used to being regulated by the GMC, introduce them to our professional standards, etc., and discuss some of the issues and challenges they may well face working in the UK coming from other countries. And it's, it's proven to be a very successful uh, programme of workshops for doctors, and uh, some of you on the line may well have taken part in one yourself. <clears throat> so we also have, so this is me, as it were, I'm a regional liaison advisor in the outreach team, and 
the li li liaison advisors. They're my colleagues who work in uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. <clears throat> so part of the team, we also have employer liaison advisors, rather confusingly similar names, but different roles. So my employer liaison advisor or ELA colleagues, they work very closely with the responsible officers in your organisations, whether that's a, a secondary care trust or a community trust or, a, or even a primary care organisation or indeed an independent organisation. Uh, so they have a, a regular meetings with the responsible officers. Uh, so these are the senior people, the medical directors who will make recommendations uh, about uh, revalidation, of course, uh, but also they'll be dealing with local fitness to practice issues in their organisations. So they have those regular meetings to support the responsible officers to to make the best decision possible uh, and to really just to see if it is necessary to, to refer anything to the GMC. Uh, so our role or the, or the ELA's role is to really support the uh, the local systems to deal with these issues uh, locally uh, and then if it does need to come to the GMC obviously it will do but uh, there's a lot of conversation that goes on before that happens so this is where the support starts I suppose in terms of the outreach team in the work that myself and my colleagues do running our workshops coming out and engaging with doctors and medical students and my ELA colleagues who are helping the local systems deal with those fitness to practice issues and those revalidation uh, issues as well. So our support, as I say, starts at that, that very local level uh, and uh, will continue to do so because we, uh, our outreach team is, is uh, uh, expanding into new areas now and we're, we're developing more, more products and support we can offer. So let's look at the, the concerns that do come into the GMC. So I'll just be talking about those concerns that have been brought to our attention, not about anything that might have gone into the local NHS complaint systems. <clears throat> Just those that uh, have come through our door, if you like. <clears throat> and as you can see on the slide there, these are the type of issues or, or you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the starting block, if you like, that we'll be looking at. Very, very important point that we do uh, try and give the support that's needed to try and deal with these issues locally. Um, stop them coming into the GMC <clears throat> because they can be dealt with quickly uh, if they're done, dealt with locally. Um, and of course, you know, uh, hopefully the stress uh, on the individual doctor could be reduced to some extent. So we we are, and for many years now, we have been trying to to make sure that they can be dealt with locally. Obviously, if it's a very serious matter, it, it will have to come to the GMC. So these, these are the sort of starting block, if you like. Uh, and if there's a, a health issue relating to uh, a doctor, maybe their doctor's health uh, is impacting on their uh, their fitness to practice. That might be um, uh, uh, sort of mental health issues, for example, or substance abuse. Which, and again, I'll I'll share some information about that. Then again, we'll try and help the local systems deal deal with those locally. But we'd only really be interested or get involved in those issues if the doctor's health is compromising. Uh, patient safety. If it's been dealt with locally, if there's support, local, maybe some counselling, for example, and the doctor can carry on practising, if there's no, no sort of compromise to patient safety. So all these discussions will be going on at a local level uh, before, uh, you know, the decision is made to come to the GMC. So a little bit more information, uh, obviously, um, what would concern us, as you can see there, a serious or persistent failure to follow our professional standards, our guidance that we produce. And hopefully you'll be aware now that we've just uh, updated our core piece of guidance, good medical practice, uh, which became effective from this week, in fact, from the 30th of January. So we now, now have a new uh, good medical practice document for all doctors to look at. And I'll, again, I'll share, uh, share some brief information about that at the end of my presentation. So, as you can see on the slide there, those local measures have failed. So they, they've come up to the GMC, so they've been escalated up to the GMC. And the bottom bullet point there, normally only investigate concerns that would require us to take action to remove or restrict a doctor's right to practice. So that means that maybe, uh, you know, in those very rare circumstances where a doctor has to come off the register, again, life-changing, career-changing issue for those doctors, don't get me wrong, <clears throat> but that gives you an idea of the seriousness 
of the the issues that the GMC would be dealing with. <clears throat> Excuse me, got a bit of frog in my throat this morning. Just take some water. <clears throat> uh, just a little bit more information about the, the specifics, I suppose, of the type of issues that uh, we would investigate. Um, Obviously, issues about uh, patient care, discrimination against patients, colleagues or others, fraud or dishonesty. You can see there on the list, doctor's health I've mentioned. But again, if it's being managed locally, that would be another uh, another matter. Um, those are the type of it, the sort of the, the groupings, if you like, of those issues. Uh, and now if we have a triage uh, sort of system, you're doctors, you're very familiar with triaging. So we would look at. The issues that comes into us, we we have very high thresholds uh, for those um, concerns that would have to be investigated by us because it's, as I say, the seriousness of the issue. <clears throat> so those concerns would come through our um, uh, our uh, triage, uh, and then if we dis <clears throat> so at this stage, probably we we wouldn't uh, the doctor wouldn't be informed that we're looking at concern because they you know we just don't have the resources to do that. But if it was to go through our triage and enter the investigation process, then definitely we would make contact with the, the doctor uh, and, and tell them about the, the issue and the support we can offer. And I'll give you more information about that uh, later on in the presentation. So once it's gone into our triage, once it's gone through our triage and is being investigated, certainly the doctor would be informed. It's just a few, few numbers for you. Um, as you can see there, we, we record um, a lot of data uh, in the GMC. We publish it all on our website. So all the information I'm sharing with you is on the website. Uh, so we've done some trend analysis. So we've been keeping this type of data for many years now, going back to 2012, as you can see there. So this is gives you a, a trajectory of the complaints and concerns coming into the GMC. As you can see, the trajectory is, you know, in a, in a downward direction. There was a little blip in uh, 2021 when there was an increase uh, but now you can see it's falling down so it just uh, you know 7000 uh, uh, just uh, just under 7300 uh, complaints or concerns that came into the GMC in 2022 that's the latest sort of set of data we can share with you <clears throat> but if you could hopefully you can see on the slide that that big block of orange in that column uh, 79% shows that those concerns were closed immediately. So it would it was never going to meet our thresholds. It was never going to go through our triage. So that huge chunk of concerns that come into the GMC just don't meet our thresholds for investigation and they, they have to be sort of responded back to the local systems. And we do, you know, we get patients uh, who might complain to the GMC about issues that have nothing to do with the doctor's fitness to practice. So obviously we need to uh, sort of look at those carefully and they might, they might be dealt with maybe in the local NHS uh, complaint system. So, you know, relatively, uh, Huge numbers are closed immediately. 79% of those 7,300 don't go anywhere near our triaging uh, sort of processes. Now, let's see if I can... I seem to have lost the chat uh, box. I hope, hopefully you can still uh, use the chat bar, but I can't see it on my screen here. So we'll try something new, see if this happens. Hoping maybe somebody can tell me. Can, um, can, uh, can you see the chat box, Maya? Yeah, so... Um... If you if you look at more, you know these three dots. You can click on it, and there is it the chat box. But alternatively, if you're happy for people to sort of open their microphones, they can just raise their hands. Yeah, because I'm showing my uh, slides, I've lost the those three dots, as you say, which normally I'd be able to see. Uh, but anyway, we'll go with it, and maybe May, you you can be my uh, okay. my uh, help here. Oh, hang on, here we go. It's just the, dropped down. Nothing. There we go. Yeah. Ah, I've got it there. There you go. <clears throat> My computer playing around with me. So just uh, um, a little bit of engagement for you to see if uh, we can we can sort of get some ideas from me, if I can get my slide to move on. Here we are. Now, shall I move that? Is, are you seeing my chat box right in the middle of my screen there? Or can you see, just see the slide now? Um, you can see the slide. See the slide. All right. So you're not being disrupted. So in... I've got two screens going here, so it's a bit complicated. So just a, a question for you, really. And just to, uh, you know, uh, 
use the chat function, see if you can engage in this. So 2022, those date, that data I showed you, how many complaints do you think came from members of the public? So we had a total of 7,300. I showed you on that previous slide, uh, just under 7,300. So how many do you think of those came from members of the public? And just, uh, just put your... Uh, response in the chat box, either the letter or the number. It's up to you whether whatever is easiest for you. So we've got a few. Thank you very much. We've got a few responses coming in. If you've gone with B, which is 5373, E, uh, a little bit lower, 4,000, just over 4,000. A couple of responses around five, the C, 544. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Obviously, uh, we can't wait for all of us to respond. There's 50 over 50 doctors on the line, so we'll just we'll just give uh, give you a couple of seconds to respond. Okay, so we got a mixed response. Um, most most going for the higher number, which <clears throat> is the correct answer. So, of all of those um, concerns, 7,300 concerns, over 5,000 came from patients from members of the public. So, you know, a massive, massive sort of proportion. Then you can see on the on the slide there um, other routes that would come into the GMC <clears throat> uh, from the employer, from the trust, the organisation doctors work for, etc. From um, uh, services like the police and, 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 uh, and other sort of social services, maybe. But by far, the biggest um, number is from members of the public. So my next question. So we have five thousand three hundred seventy three. From the public so what percentage of that figure um do you think would meet the gmc's th criteria for an investigation so 5300 or so so what percentage do you think could we investigate as a as a regulator so we've got a few uh few, again <clears throat> a mixed mixed responses which is good I mean, there's no right or wrong answers here it's just, just to get you engaging in the in the session 13%, a few, 8%, a few. Most people, I'd say most people going for the 8 or or 4%, I think. Say that's true. Well, let me put you out of your misery and give you the answer. So the answer is 4%. <clears throat> so very low percentage of pu uh, patient or public complaints would meet our thresholds because they're just, you know, you know, I'm not, again, not being glib about these issues but we've we've had patients complaining to us that the doctor next door hasn't cut their hedge properly or hasn't cut their hedge for a few years you know that obviously is nothing to do with the gmc uh, but maybe there's an issue there as to uh, the what we need to do to make patients more aware of what we can deal with uh, so four uh, percent and then on this slide we sort of give you an idea of um the other routes in and how likely it is that they may um, meet an investigation threshold. So I've, I've highlighted uh, the police. So obviously we have fairly low numbers coming in from the police services, but because of the seriousness of the nature, there's probably some criminal activity or might be a court case involved. It's more likely that we would investigate it because it's more serious. So you can see, uh, you know, there's a 67% or uh, proportion uh, that we would uh, investigate then from the employer as well. Uh, very high there, the, high, the highest uh, rate, if you like, uh, in terms of the likelihood of an investigation, because we've had that local conversation with employers, we've tried to deal with it locally, that hasn't been the case, and so it's had to be escalated to the GMC, so it's gone through the local process already, so that's why it's more likely that we'll investigate them at the GMC. So that just, uh, again, give you an idea, and again, of course, uh, what I should have mentioned at the beginning uh, of, of my presentation. I'm very happy to share these slides. So you'll be able to get the, all these figures and this data with you. You can have a look at it it's, uh, in a bit more detail at your leisure. So our fitness practice processes. So once the, the concern has met our triage and it's gone into our investigation process, what happens then? Just a little bit more detail about the concerns that would go into an investigation. It's about public protection. It's about maintaining the public's confidence in the medical profession. Doctors enjoy huge levels of trust with the public. Um, all the evidence shows that doctors and nurses have the highest levels of trust, more than the police, more than the clergy, more than judges even. 
uh, enormous levels of trust with the patient and the public. And of course, you need that in order to do your job properly. So part of our role as a regulator is to help maintain those levels of trust. So these are, you know, uh, the, the, the issues that uh, we're more likely to be concerned about uh, coming in to the GMC. Just to, <clears throat> whilst you're looking at that slide, and just to uh, give you a little bit more background, <clears throat> we mention uh, health there, and we mentioned sort of uh, dependency issues, etc., or mental health is health issues. A doctor can't be taken off the register purely for a health concern. Maybe the health concern is part of the bigger picture, but it's very, very unlikely that the doctor will be taken off purely because of that health concern. There would be other extenuating factors as well, part of that uh, picture. And again, we would offer as much support and we try and engage with the local systems to offer support for doctors uh, in those issues because again you know doctors working in very stressful environments notice there that we mentioned clinical uh, issues but it's again unlikely uh, for a one-off clinical error unless it's incredibly serious but it's unlikely that those clinical one-off clinical issues will be coming to the gmc because issues, you know, issues like that will ha happen. I mean, doctors are very clever people, uh, but uh, errors can occur, and they do occur. But they should they should be dealt with locally. So don't don't take my word for it. Uh, take the BMJ's word for it, if you like. Uh, this is an article from the BMJ, uh, just reinforcing that point that those one-off single um, clinical issues uh, unlikely to uh, to face a, a GMC investigation. Uh, they should be dealt with locally. <clears throat> and in fact, if we do receive um, uh, a concern about a clinical issue. We have a process in place. We've been running this process now for, well, since 2016. Uh, we call it provisional inquiries. That's our term for it. But we would deal with this uh, issue very quickly. So we'd respond very quickly. We'd get more information, maybe uh, we'd uh, in, uh, engage an expert to look at the issue. We'd get some medical records. We'd obviously liaise with the doctor. So by getting that information very quickly, we can decide whether we need to look at it in more detail. And that is reducing the number of these type of issues that we do deal with. Because once we've got all that information, in many cases, we realize there's no, no need for it to, to be investigated. And so it would be closed a lot quicker. So that's one of the, the sort of uh, improvements to our processes that we put in place to try and alleviate um, uh, the, the stress and the strain on doctors. I think it's important to just tell you about um, the, the the sort of difference between the GMC and another organisation called the Medical Practitioners Tribunal Service. It's a bit of a bit of a long-winded title, a bit of a mouthful. So the GMC, um, we, uh, if you like, we would receive uh, the concern initially. We would investigate the concern, uh, get that information, if you like, get the uh, the expert involved, get the uh, the, the the more uh, medical records, maybe even witness statements. We might go that far. So we do the initial investigation. <coughs> Excuse me. If we then think it's of a serious enough nature, where maybe uh, the doctor could potentially be uh, suspended from the register or taken off the register, then we refer it to the MPTS. So we don't adjudicate on those issues. So we investigate and the MPTS adjudicate by arranging those the panels, the tribunal panels that you may have may have heard of. Uh, and so the the MPTS is it's, it, the term is operationally independent of the GMC. It has its own governance system. It has its own chair. It has its own sort of internal uh, uh, sort of governance. Having said that, um, the uh, the staff that work at the MPTS are funded by the GMC, but there is that operational independence because it wasn't it, it was decided that it wasn't proper for the GMC to be uh, to investigate and adjudicate on these issues. There had to be some level of independence. And so the <clears throat> the panels that you may have heard of, <clears throat> they will be uh, they will be um, uh, created uh, and set up by the MPTS <clears throat> up in excuse me. Just gonna have a <clears throat> clear my throat. Their, uh, their offices are up in Manchester. Most of the uh, hearings are available to uh, open to the public. Uh, apart from a health issue, if it's a health issue, they are closed hearings. 
<clears throat> so that's the difference between the GMC and the MPTS. <clears throat> so I'll just show you this issue. I always, I'm always very worried about showing this type of slide, particularly to doctors maybe in their F1 and F2 year. So this shouldn't be taken <laughs> if you're if you are in your F1, F2 year. It shouldn't be taken to decide which specialty you want to go into. I think, you know, you go with the specialty that you're passionate about in the first instance. <clears throat> but I am showing you the data. I, t I told you I'd show you the data. Uh, so in terms of the uh, the specialties, in terms of the concerns we do receive, uh, uh, paediatrics, and obviously I'm talking to uh, the right group here, <clears throat> it's quite high up in the sort of uh, the number of complaints that we or concerns that we do receive uh, coming into the GMC. Not the highest, uh, but quite high up there. So um, the uh, just take you through that slide. <clears throat> Number of doctors complained about 1,000, just over 1,000. That's uh, that's the, 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 uh, the figure to look at. Then if you look at uh, the net, if you go along that, that, that row, number of doctors investigated, 334. So 1,000. Um, Doctors were, you know, there was a concern. 334 of those doctors were investigated, went through our investigation process. Again, for each and every one of those doctors, a very, very stressful place to be. But again, it's just giving you an idea, a flavor of the, the numbers involved. <clears throat> so that's fitness to practice. That's the figures. That's the data. That's the, uh, the processes, if you like. Just also to share with you some of the research that the GMC uh, independently commissioned and very important research because the research we commission then helps us improve our processes, which we we do. <clears throat> and a few years ago now, we we uh, asked uh, Roger Klein, uh, very uh, eminent in his field, uh, to uh, lead uh, a piece of research for us uh, about about the the concerns or the the issue that we'd identified in terms of the the cohort of doctors that were being uh, uh, referred to the GMC. Uh, so we thought we needed to look into this in a bit more detail because our our data was showing us there was something uh, that needed was flagged up that we needed to look at in a bit more detail. So Roger and his team did some research for us. Uh, and again, it's on our website for you to have a look at. And what that research found, and this is obviously the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the issue we're talking about, because the issue... Um, we identified was employers likely to refer certain cohorts of doctors to uh, both local and GMC fitness to practice processes. And what this piece of research found, and you can see there on the slide there, and I'll just talk you through those uh, those two sort of boxes. So compared to UK graduates, non-UK graduates, uh, more than two and a half times more likely to be referred to the GMC from the, by their employer. So these are the trusts, the organisations that doctors work for. And then BAME doctors refer to about double the rate. Yeah. Now, there's lots of reasons behind that. And, and uh, the Fair to Refer uh, data research did um, give us a lot of really useful information to, to go on to really drill down into this issue. And I'll just give you a flavour again, summary of the findings there. There's too much to go into there in the time we have this morning. But just to pick out a few of these issues here, <clears throat> so lack of effective, honest and timely feedback. The research found that some managers, they avoid difficult conversations, especially if they're from a different uh, different ethnic group than the doctor, because they just feel uncomfortable and uneasy about having those conversations, which is not ideal at all. <clears throat> and of course, what that means is if those conversations aren't happening at an early stage, then maybe the, the, uh, the issue escalates and gets a bit more serious and that, then that might uh, mean a referral is needed. There's, um, I'm sure you're you're familiar with this, uh, in, inadequate support uh, or, or induction. Onboarding is, again, another term that's used. So doctors from overseas not getting sufficient induction and onboarding to the organisations. So, again, maybe they're, they're sort of missing out on the support they need. Isolated work patterns for some doctors, uh, non-UK graduates, and again, if that that is the case, they're lacking, they're missing out on the exposure to those learning opportunities. Maybe working with senior mentors and colleagues, etc. <clears throat> and there's also, uh, you know, issues about some UK doctors um, having a. I'm trying to be diplomatic about this. 
but having a fair, you know, not not a supportive response to the qualifications of their colleagues coming in from overseas. So some real issues there that, you know, the, the research highlighted for us that we've now taken on board and we're working with and trying to incorporate into the work we do. What are the, the most practical uh, sort of actions we've taken on the back of this research <clears throat> is any referral now that comes into the GMC from a responsible officer there will be a conversation had at a local level the responsible officer will be asked to uh, explain what the uh, particularly for non-UK graduates the responsible officer will be asked to explain what support and induction was given to that doctor initially if there's been any uh, uh, efforts made to remediate locally so there'll be you know a, a, a fairly sort of robust conversation had at a local level to see if more support can be, can be given locally before it comes to the GMC. <clears throat> We've set ourselves some targets as well, not surprisingly on the back of that. So in terms of that, what we call disproportionate referrals. So uh, the, the previous slide I show you, <clears throat> our, our challenge, and it is a bit of a challenge, is to uh, uh, reduce or eliminate rather those disproportionate referrals by 2026 and again there's work ongoing to help us get to that and then also there was also an issue identified in the education uh, undergraduate level in terms of um, uh, uh, those graduates from certain cohorts passing their medical degree and moving on and there was uh, certain issues there that we're working with too and again this is a longer process because of the uh, the timeline for uh, undergraduate education in the UK. So we've set ourselves targets and we're working to those targets and progress is made, being made. It's, you know, it's slow progress, but we are making progress. Just a few, uh, just to sort of uh, start start coming to an end now, because uh, uh, I'm sure there's some Q&As you might want to, to ask. Just a few uh, examples of some real life cases that did come into the, U, uh, to, to the GMC and were dealt with. Uh, so this was a doctor who um, did admit that uh, their fitness practice was impaired. So again, they were showing insight. They were showing learning from the issue, accepted the actions um, and then started remediation. So the tribunal, the MPTS tribunal panel concluded that actions were required to maintain uh, public confidence in the profession. Although recognising that the doctor was a very good doctor and had potential, so it was not in the doctor's best interest or indeed in the public's best interest to uh, impose a longer suspension than the six-month suspension. So again, that gives you an idea of the contextual issues that those panel tribu those tribunal panels will look at. <clears throat> this is a, another example, a bit more complicated, and again, I think it sort of highlights that if you see a headline in the newspaper, there's always a little bit more in the background. So this <clears throat> this was a headline in the, the newspaper a few years ago. You can see there there was an eight month suspension. <clears throat> but this was a, a, a doctor who used um, their sister's disabled person's travel pass. This is a, a London Transport for London travel pass. Used it uh, 80 times, eight zero times. They were then spotted by a ticket inspector. Uh, and then there was a fine imposed in the magistrate's court, £200 fine. But the, the reason it, it got to the GMC and there was a, a suspension uh, uh, sanction was, was given because uh, when the doctor was... Um, uh, 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 <clears throat> when the doctor was found out by the ticket inspector and, and their sort of transport for London processes were put in place, uh, the doctor claimed that the pass was was hers and not her sister's. Uh, she also claimed it was a, a one-off situation that she hadn't been using this pass. But of course, TfL were able to, to look at the number of times the pass had been used and it had been used over 80 times and it was normally used on the doctor's route into work. And they also found that the doctor's own travel pass hadn't been used at all during that period. So <clears throat> by by not showing insight at the early stages and by giving false information at the early stages, it got more serious. And that's why it came to the GMC, because, you know, you might think, well, what on earth has that got to do with the doctor's fitness to practice? But by showing a lack of insight and being dishonest, it did have an impact on the doctor's fitness to practice. So, again, I'm not being glib about these issues. I'm just sharing the information with you and the, the, the cases. So let's very quickly go through the support that we do give to doctors once they are involved in a, 
uh, in a fitness to practice issue. We have specially trained colleagues that would deal with vulnerable doctors. So those doctors that come to us maybe for health issues, they have, our colleagues have special training and the doctor will be given a single point of contact, a named individual they can talk to in the GMC. This uh, just to uh, give you uh, uh, somewhere to go, signpost you to our website where you can find out more about the support we give to doctors. Um, there have been many changes to our processes that um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to gloss over this slide, but you can have a look at it uh, in your, at your leisure. Again, we commissioned some independent research to look at our processes by uh, Professor Appleby, and there was a lot of recommendations from the Appleby report that we're incorporating. <clears throat> One of those very practical um, support mechanisms we have is the Doctor Support Service. This is a, a service that's run by the BMA, uh, and you don't have to be a BMA, uh, BMA uh, member to use it so it's run by the BMA and it offers emotional support to doctors uh, and investigation it doesn't give legal advice it offers emotional support uh, but it's funded by the GMC so we fund this on behalf of the BMA so the BMA run it uh, for the benefit of doctors involved in investigations the communication investigation team this was one of the recommendations from the Appleby review so we have a specialist team now in the GMC that would uh, deal with, as you can see there, uh, those issues that may relate to a doctor's health, mental health or substance abuse, whatever it may be. Uh, and they are they have the special training, there's the, the, the processes they will use. And as you can see there, if, uh, if there's a need for a pause for an investigation, because maybe the doctor's health has deteriorated and they need a bit more support locally, uh, then again, we, we can instigate pauses in our investigation to hopefully better support the doctor. So a lot of you know support there. It is a work in progress. Uh, we do continuously try to improve our fitness to practice processes. We do commission independent audits every year to look at our processes to make sure there's no issues that we need to be aware of. Uh, um, bias is also an issue that, of course, you'll be familiar with, and we make sure that wherever possible, that's eradicated. So it's an ongoing process, but we we continue to move in the right direction, I think. Welcome to UK Practice. I mentioned this at the beginning when you saw me talking to that group of doctors. This is a programme we do offer to doctors new to the UK. So if anyone on the line, if you're relatively new to the UK uh, or you know somebody that is and they haven't been on one of these courses, then please do go on our website. Uh, you can book yourself on the course. Uh, we run them virtually more or less now. Um, and we do run them about uh, two, two a month now. So we do, we're getting through big numbers. So again, uh, have a look on the website if you're interested or if your colleagues are interested in that course. Just to round off, just to remind you <clears throat> that good medical practice has now been revised. We now have a, an updated version, became effective from the 30th of January. Lots of information on our website for you to have a look at about the new version of good medical practice. So please do have a look at that. So that's uh, my contact details. Very happy to take any questions if we have time now to take some questions. If not, when you get the slides, uh, please do use my contact details to give me a ring or to drop me an email. But over, over to you and see if there's any immediate questions. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Howard. It was, that was very informative and I find the data very interesting. Um, especially when it comes to the number of complaints you, you normally receive and how many you actually act on. Yes, yes, um, probably low, lower than you thought. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're running a bit late, um, okay. so maybe we have like one or two minutes for questions. Um, we have a couple of questions about whether, like in pediatrics, um, what what sort of the levels or the roles of the you know the doctors that being complained again normally in pediatrics <clears throat> oh in, in terms of their seniority you mean yes <clears throat> um i mean it, well it, it does it varies really i couldn't give you a, a definitive answer i mean in terms of the I, I think it's more relevant to think in terms of the type of issue that uh, we're dealing with because all the evidence shows that um doctor doctors in those sort of training roles or maybe two or three years after they've got their their pmq the type of issues that because they're getting such great clinical supervision the clinical issues don't come to us it may be issues around probity honesty etc and the the further away a doctor would get from their pmq qualification 
that those issues tend to change and it might might be other issues that come to our attention um it, it's quite I, I couldn't give you a definitive response in terms of a percentage of consultants or or junior doctors i think our data doesn't go into that detail uh, but it, i think you need to think about the issues rather than the, the the level or the seniority of the doctor really and and does the seniority affect the the process of decision making um, when it comes to the gmc you will you like <laughs> It, it, no, it shouldn't. It shouldn't do at all. No, it shouldn't do. I mean, what what really does? I mean, obviously, we, you know, sometimes we're accused of, of taking too long with our investigations, and I think, you know, I think that's uh, that's a, a a valid sort of concern that's raised with us, because sometimes these 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 issues are very complex, and we need to get lots of information. We might need to get witness statements. We might need to em employ an expert. Uh, again, another clinician who's expert in that field <clears throat> to look at the issue on our behalf. Uh, so um, the process would be the same depending on the seniority of the individual. What really does make a difference to our processes is the insight the doctor shows, <clears throat> whether the doctor is uh, accepting there's been an issue that needs to be dealt with, whether they engage with the process, whether they provide the information that's required, whether they uh, engage with our teams that are doing the the investigations. That level of insight can have a real impact on the the eventual outcome of a of an, of an investigation. I beg your pardon. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got some more questions coming in. Um, so there was a question about the BMA support. Um, when there is like investigation or there's like penalty against a doctor by the GMC, does the BMA have any rule? Any, any, what? Sorry, I missed that bit. Um, the BMA, the British Medical Association, do, do they have any role when when it comes to complaints? Like, would they try to to make things better for the doctors or affect <laughs> the decision with the GMC, or is it really have a role? <clears throat> uh, I think. Well, well, in terms of because the BMA is a trade union, and they, uh, they, they. I mean, I don't want to speak on behalf of the BMA. I'm sure they can do that themselves, but they don't tend to get involved in individual cases. They might support. Uh, as they have done in the in the past, they might support a very high profile sort of court case, if you like. Uh, we certainly know that's the case. But on an individual uh, sort of investigation, <clears throat> the Doctors Medical Defence Organisation would be the like the Medical Protection Society or the Medical Defence Union. Those type of organisations, they would be the organisation that would offer that practical support. Mm -hmm. Because if it's a very uh, serious issue and it does go to a uh, an MPTS tribunal panel, then legal um, support is needed. You know, the doctor would need to have legal advice and maybe a legal representative at the panel itself. And that's where <clears throat> the medical defence organisations would help. So that's why it's really important that all doctors have uh, have that sort of um, uh, uh, connection with a, a medical defence organisation. They, they, you know, they they're, they're a member of a, a medical defence organisation in the unlikely case that they do need legal representation. Where the BMA do help, of course, <clears throat> is with, as I mentioned, that that doctor support service where they can provide that emotional support to doctors. The doctor support service is staffed by doctors themselves, many of whom may have had experience of uh, fitness to practice processes. So they can offer that emotional support. But on a practical level, that's where your medical defence organisation would be very important. Okay, and um, we've got some more questions coming in, but we're really running out of okay. time. So uh, maybe we can ask our Philippe to contact you directly. Um, thank you. Absolutely, very happy. As I say, I'll send these slides around. I'll send them to, to you, May. You can distribute them to your colleagues. Very okay. happy to take okay. emails or phone calls, yeah. All right, thank you very much. And I'm sorry we were not able to answer all your questions. That's okay. That was a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, you too. Um, so next we have um, Mr. Sheath, Mr. John Sheath. Uh, thank you for Morning. joining us. Um, Mr. John Sheath is um, the trust legal advisor. In Please do interrupt me though if you've got questions. There we go. Okay. You'll find as, as pediatricians that other team members do expect you to know a bit about the laws that apply to children's consent and detention. So. In particular, there are two statutes in the UK that you must know a little bit about, 
And then there's one very famous case which has changed how we think of children's consent very dramatically since 1985. The way that we thought it'd be useful to think about these is first, I'm gonna give you a very brief five, 10 minute recap of those key laws, the two statutes, one case, and then to talk about what common law means. And then we have clinical scenarios, which I'm gonna invite you to think about. And we've even got some interactive questions that you can answer about those. So let's start with the Mental Capacity Act, which is the one of the two statutes that I think you'll come across most commonly. This of course is applying to children who are 16 and over. So anyone who's 16 and over, you must know that the Capacity Act applies to these people. We're talking about somebody who has an impairment or disturbance in the functioning of the mind or brain, which prevents them from being able to make a specific decision in a specific time. And as you know from your training, first we have to show evidence that we suspect an impairment of the mind or brain, and then we test whether the person can understand, retain, weigh up, and communicate information about those decisions. When I was invited to give this talk, I was asked to just comment on deprivation of liberty safeguards. So these safeguards, only apply to people who are 18 or over. So actually as paediatricians, you shouldn't be needing them, except, <laughs> this is why the law is difficult, if you are in a situation where you are depriving a young person of their liberty in a way that they cannot consent to, then you need to, as an emergency, apply to the Court of Protection for permission to do that. It's just that you don't use the specific deprivation of liberty safeguards framework to make that application. The case that you need to know about is from 1985. It was a 14 year old girl who went to her GP and asked for contraception. And she did this without her mum's permission or knowledge. And the GP on balance decided it was the right thing to do and gave her contraceptive advice. After which her mum sued the NHS trust and it took several years for this case to be resolved, but the ruling was from the judge and then the High Court as well, that the GP was correct to give the girl contraception. Because even though she was under 16, so she was under the age that mental capacity could be applied, she, she was demonstrating that she understood the advice and was therefore competent to consent to that specific treatment. What that means for us now is that anyone under 16, outside of the, the window of the Mental Capacity Act, can still consent to their own treatment if you can demonstrate that they are competent to do so and that they understand what it is that you're offering. We call that Gillick competence now. If a young person zero to 15 doesn't seem to understand, doesn't seem to have competence to do it, then instead we rely on somebody who has parental responsibility. Now that's a legal concept and someone who holds this can then consent on the behalf of a young person who is not Gillick competent. Who holds parental responsibility? Well by default married parents and if the parents are not married then mother holds parental responsibility always and father does as well if he's on the birth certificate. Divorced parents also, interestingly enough, still both hold parental responsibility. What it means is that you can treat and detain young people who are not Gillick competent on the basis of parental consent, but there are some limits to the types of things that parents can consent to. And maybe we'll think about those in the later discussion. You have to believe that the parents are both capacitous, they both have capacity to decide on child's behalf, and you also have to believe that they're acting in the child's best interests. If you don't, then instead you can overrule the parents' decisions. This is a summary of, I suppose, a simple way to think about whether a young person can consent to treatment and what the legal framework might be. First, we use this cutoff that we have to know of 16. And if a child is 16 or over, then the Mental Capacity Act applies, meaning you can assess their capacity if you have doubt. If they have capacity, then of course, they can make decisions on their own behalf. 
And if they don't, then we're thinking about the Mental Capacity Act. We're using it then to act in their best interests. And that will involve everyone around them in making that decision. From ages zero to 15, so under 16, instead we have this much vaguer concept of Gillick competence. If you believe they are competent to make a decision about the treatment, if you think they understand it properly, then they're Gillick competent and they can consent to the treatment. If they're not, they don't seem to understand, then instead we rely on the agreement and consent of somebody who holds parental responsibility. I've put a note on the side there, it's very important. It's that in children under 16, so in this younger group, if they're refusing life-saving treatment, even if they're Gillick competent, you can overrule them with the agreement of a court of protection. And that comes back to common law, which we're gonna talk a little more about in a moment. Let's touch on the Mental Health Act. This is one that as psychiatrists we are using all the time and you'll just see and won't necessarily be applying as often. This one, unlike mental capacity, applies to every child. So every single person, in fact, of any age can be detained and treated under the Mental Health Act. We're talking about people who have a diagnosable mental disorder and the six sections of the act that you're going to come across most often are these ones. Two, three, five, both parts there, 17 and 136. Sections two and three are for mental health professionals. And this is about admitting patients to mental health facilities for assessment and treatment of a mental disorder. Section 17 is what we use to allow short-term leave from facilities while a patient is under a different section. 136 is what the police use to bring a young person into hospital if they have suspicion of a mental disorder. But section five is the one that you need to know a bit about because that's the one that allows you as a doctor to detain an inpatient. So this only applies to someone who's already admitted to your hospital, but you can then detain them there legally for 72 hours under section five brackets two, in order to arrange a mental health act assessment. So let's go back to our little algorithm and thinking about detention that's holding people in hospital or another facility. If you suspect they have a mental disorder, yes, then the mental health act may well apply. If you don't, well then the rules about detention are the same as with consent. If they're under 16, it's related to Gillick competence or parental responsibility. If they're over 16, then we think about their mental capacity and potentially use the Mental Capacity Act. If both the Capacity Act and the Mental Health Act could apply, so in a young person where you suspect a mental disorder and they clearly lack capacity to decide that they should be discharged, if the Mental Health Act could apply, we must always think about that first. It trumps the Capacity Act, legally speaking. All right, I said we'd talk about common law and this is important because this is a very big fallback option for you as clinicians. It, 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 it's, it's used in practice all the time. It's not a specific single law, it's actually a collection of various laws. The summary of which is that we are expected always to do what other people would agree is reasonable in order to protect and preserve life. Sometimes that even means forceful treatment or detention. One example of a law that's under common law is Chil the Children's Act, which says here that a person who has care of the child but does not have parental responsibility, so that's you as a doctor, may do what is reasonable in all the circumstances of the case for the purposes of safeguarding or promoting the child's welfare. What that means is that you could provide emergency treatment without the young person's consent in order to save their life in certain situations and that it could be justified under the Children's Act, but just generally under common law. So that's my very, very quick summary of the key pieces of law that you need to know a little bit about. We've put together some clinical situations that are really supposed to prompt our thinking and I'm hoping we'll start some discussion. I do see there's 
things appearing in the chat, which I'll read in a moment. But let me read out this scenario. You're seeing a 10 year old boy in clinic who's recently injured his knee. He's otherwise well, but he's in a lot of pain. He asks for analgesia, but his mum doesn't want him to have it. She doesn't trust pain medications and she insists you don't give him any. He doesn't seem to fully understand some of the risks that come with, for example, opiates. My question to you, and this is interactive, if you would like, if you've got a moment to join either with the QR code or going to slido.com and putting in that number there. My question for you is, would you give him analgesia? There isn't a correct answer here. This isn't a, like a, a test, right? I've, I've not selected a, a predetermined answer. This is purely for our thinking and discussion. We're just going to see what people think. Would you give him analgesia? And I've put some options there about yes or no. And if yes or no, what framework might you be thinking of using? And let's see what people think. Okay, we're getting some answers in. Okay, I'm gonna give you another 30 seconds or so. Okay, and let's stop. I'm going to stop the poll just there. Okay. Oh, have I stopped it? Not quite. Actually, I'll leave it running. It's fine. Okay. All right. So we've got 13 responses. All right. And most people are saying, yes, you give analgesia to this 10 year old boy who wants it, who doesn't seem to understand the risks of it, and whose mum is saying, no, he mustn't have it. Okay. So the first, the most common answer here for everyone is yes, under common law. All right. OK, so I understand that. So you're saying you think, you know, it's in his best interests. The benefits outweigh the risks. So if he wants it, he can have it. The difficulty with that is that firstly, in the scenario, uh, I've, I've written it that because he doesn't seem to understand the risks, he probably falls in the not Gillick competent category. He's under 16. So capacity isn't relevant, but he therefore is either Gillick competent or not. If he doesn't fully understand the treatment, then because he's not Gillick competent, we need to rely on parental responsibility. And in this case, mum holds that. So while mum is saying, absolutely no, he can't have it. Our first task is really to try and persuade her to have her agreement. You can, in the eyes of the law, go against parental agreement if, well, as in parental refusal, if you have a case to say that parent isn't acting in the child's best interests. So that might be what you're thinking when you say yes under common law is, I disagree with mum, I think it's in his best interests to treat, so that's what I'm going to do. And I think... You know, in this situation, if you were to do that, there is an argument for saying that. Easier in practice would be to try and persuade mum, wouldn't it, and get her agreement? Because if she does agree, then we don't have a problem. We have parental consent, someone with parental responsibility, and we can give the treatment. I'm going to pause a second because we've got lots of questions coming in the chat. So. All right. OK, the first one is what exactly comes under deprivation of liberty? Examples, please. OK. Now, this is a very, very big topic. A deprivation of liberty, though, has a simple test that we can all use that comes from the safeguards in 2009, but which is helpful to have in your mind. The first is, is the young person under continuous supervision and control? And the second is, are they free to leave? So continuous supervision and control can look like a lot of things. Are they being monitored by the staff? Are they being watched for a certain risk? Are they having vitals checked? Are they mm, 
uh, is someone making sure they know where they are at all times, for example, that would all count. And then crucially, are they free to leave or not? And if, if both of, if they're not free to leave and they're being monitored continuously, then the law would say they are being deprived of their liberty. What's essential to understand is that that only matters in patients who cannot consent to it. So if somebody is lacks capacity over 16 or is not Gillick competent under 16, then if they're under continuous supervision and control on your ward, for example, and not free to leave, then they're being deprived of their liberty, even if they're agreeing to it. So even if they're there perfectly happy and seemingly consenting, because they cannot consent in the eyes of the law, they're being deprived of their liberty. So the most common situation for that would be on the paediatric wards or in our mental health facilities. And it would especially be to do with the types of control that we put around young people. For example, access to phones, access to the internet, access to food and access to the outside. The next question, what if a child is adopted who has parental responsibility then? Yeah, good. So if they're adopted, adoptive parents can apply for and then attain parental responsibility. You should assume if they've been adopted that the adoptive parents, again, if they're married, both hold it. And then that's Dr. Hussein there. Okay, legality around the sexual acts between 13 and 15, 15, 17, 15, 18, and 17, 18. I'm always confused. Okay, yeah. Yes, so officially there's sort of two thresholds for consent to sex in young people from uh, obviously from 18 onwards everyone is assumed to, to be able to consent to sexual activity from 16 to 18 in theory you can consent to sexual activity with the agreement of your parents but in reality i mean how often do you think it's likely that young people have asked their parents and, and you know have the agreement below the age of 16 your right is where this gray area is and suddenly it stops being about the statutes and it starts being about specific cases where for example if both parties are under 16 but not below 12 then most courts would say that that's not a crime if one of them is over 16 and one is under 16, most courts would say that is a crime. And below 12, it's absolutely considered not possible to consent to sexual activity at all. The next question is, if a child is 17, neurodiverse, treated for mental health and recovering and not sectioned, clinically improving with medication, should we discuss the treatment plan with him or her, with the parents or only with the parents? Okay. Fine, so child is 17. That means that in the eyes of the law, they can have capacity under the Mental Capacity Act. They're being treated for their mental health, so they may well have a mental disorder, but they're recovering and they're not under a section. So this is a person who's with you under no legal framework, it sounds like. Should you discuss the treatment plan with him, her and parents or just the parents? So the answer to that would be in the eyes of the law, you only need that child's consent for treatment. You don't need anyone else's consent. However, best practice is always to include not just the child in the decision making, but also the parents where possible. And I think that's intuitive, isn't it? We'd all automatically want to do that. The next one is uh, people struggling with the poll and answering about the, the poll. OK. Yeah, and someone's commented about analgesia not being life saving. Yeah, so so this is why common law would be uh, would be a little ambiguous in the case of analgesia for this boy in clinic. If we were talking about a life saving intervention, it almost wouldn't matter what parents said a lot of the time, and you could make a case for treating forcefully. But in the case of something not life saving, it does become greyer, and it, it, we would be cautious, much more cautious about going against parental's consent. The next question is, what's classified as a mental disorder? Should they be, should they have a known diagnosis of a psychiatric illness? Okay. So a mental disorder is a very broad category of problem, but it's defined in ICD-11. So it's a, a, 
a disturbance in the cognitive, emotional, and or behavioral presentation of a person resulting in impairment in their function. So there's quite a few different types of mental disorder. And when it comes to the Mental Health Act, you don't necessarily always have to have a specific psychiatric diagnosis in order to apply for certain sections. You just have to have sufficient reason to believe this person may be suffering from a mental disorder. And that's all the questions on that for now. OK, let's move on to the next scenario. OK, yeah, the same thing. But I've got another question for you about this boy. This 10 year old boy in clinic with pain, who you're thinking about analgesia, parent doesn't want him to have it. He doesn't seem to understand. What if he did understand the risks? What if he seemed to you to be compass mentis? He seemed intelligent and could understand what the risks of the analgesia were. Would that change your decision about whether or not to prescribe him pain relief? Got people putting in the poll, but also in the chat. More people saying yes, under Gillick competence. And one which is the same, yes, under Gillick competence, yes, under Gillick. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Good. And look, you, you're the majority here. Yeah, I, I would agree with you that if you want to prescribe the analgesia, if he now seems competent to understand, even though he's below 16, then yes, you would have a very strong legal backing that he's Gillick competent and he can consent to treatment, even if his parent disagrees. And someone else put in the chat, they'd still try and take mum on board, which of course is always best practice. There's a question here, can he be assumed to be Gillick competent? Okay, so with children under 16, you would never assume that they are Gillick competent necessarily. Instead, we would test it when it's needed. So that only really applies when there's disagreement between young person and parent. If parent agrees, then in a way, it's fine, isn't it? You can give the treatment. So it only really matters when parent doesn't agree, then you would check with the child and try and understand, well, whether you think they're Gillick competent or not would change if life-saving treatment yeah so life-saving treatment is its own is its own thing isn't it the more important the treatment is in a way the, the more justification you could have for overruling a parent parent's refusal in the previous scenario where mum didn't agree and he doesn't seem to understand what would we do would we give analgesia so most people said yes to that and I, i'm not here trying to tell you that there's a, a single objective right or wrong to that question. That, like I say, I haven't put correct answers on this poll. It's just to think together what we would do in real life. In real life, I think what I would do is, is, is I would work quite hard to try and persuade mum. And then if mum still really didn't agree and he wasn't Gillick competent, well, I think, you know, you could then still prescribe it anyway, but one downside to that, of course, is the practicality of how is he going to get the treatment if mum isn't, isn't going to help facilitate it? My understanding is they can be Gillick competent after 13. Is that correct? So actually, Gillick competence doesn't have a lower limit. It can be any child that you can demonstrate understands the treatment that you're suggesting. And that's the next question. What's the minimum age? Below 13, it should always be with parental consent. Not necessarily. If the child is given competent, then you can use their agreement. So who would we escalate to if we don't want to prescribe against mum's consent? Child isn't given competent. Or who do we escalate to? Legal department? Yeah, that is one of your options. That is one of your options. And the reason is, is that then you're saying, OK, we've got child who's under 16, not Gillick competent, so we need someone with parental responsibility to consent. Mum isn't consenting, but I don't believe mum's acting in child's best interests. And that's one of the legal reasons to overrule parental consent. So you could then talk to your trust legal department and say, can I check I'm not being you know, outrageous here? And if they say you're absolutely fine, then you could still prescribe. 
Social service, well, that's that's up to you. If you think it's abusive or neglectful from parent, then you could raise a safeguarding concern to social services as well. Okay, let's move to the next scenario, which hopefully will prompt some more questions and discussion. You're called to see a 15 year old girl in A&E who's vomiting. She explains that she took an overdose of her prescribed sertraline, hoping it would end her life. And now she wants to go home. I'm going to pause right there because I want to know, would you let her? We've got the same poll here and I've given you some options for legal frameworks if you would or wouldn't let her leave. 15 year old girl vomiting, took an overdose of sertraline and wants to leave A&E. Would you let her leave? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, we've got a couple of answers in the chat. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So everyone in the chat, I'm not sure if the poll is working, but... Ah, the poll is working. Okay, that's fine. Everyone in the chat is saying no. Yeah, but for different reasons, using different legal frameworks. Okay, I'm going to move the poll on. Hopefully it shows us what you said here. Ah, okay. So most people in the poll have said no under the MCA. There's a few no's under the Mental Health Act, no under common law, probably for her life pres preservation. And then we've got ye one yes under Gillick competence. Okay. And one no under parental responsibility. So because this girl is 15, you actually can't detain her under the Mental Capacity Act. That's really, really important. She's 15, the Mental Capacity Act does not apply. So if you need to keep her in the department, then you have to think about other ways to do that. In her case, you remember our algorithm, do you suspect a mental disorder? And I would argue from the fact that she has overdosed with the attempt to end her life on a prescribed mental health medication, that most of us would agree there's justification for suspecting she's suffering a mental disorder. That being the case, what would happen in real life most often with this girl is she would be detained, exactly, depression is one option, she would be detained probably under Section 5.2 of the Mental Health Act, but the way that that's done, you have to have to have to know this, it can only happen for people who are admitted. Remember, she's in A&E. So if you're going to try and detain her under the Mental Health Act, she needs to be formally admitted to the hospital, probably to a paediatric bed, and then she can be sectioned under 5-2 for 72 hours to that bed. Detaining her under common law. Yeah, so again, I think, I think most people would agree that's probably fine. And that you know you're act you're you're acting there in an attempt to save her life where we can we must think about legal frameworks like the mental health act if they could apply so a 5-2 would be even better someone's asked what act applies if they're at home so at home is a whole other situation you don't have many legal powers for detaining and admitting young people who are at home even in their best interests what would have to happen is the police would have to be involved. And if you suspect a mental disorder, then the police can use the Mental Health Act Section 135 to get a warrant to bring a young person in to a place of safety for assessment and treatment. If you don't have Mental Health Act as an option when they're at home, well, you could think about the Mental Capacity Act in children over 16. And in children under 16, again, you need parental responsibility. You need parents agreement for any interventions you're going to try. OK, so someone said yes, under Gillick competence. OK, so if this 15 year old seems to understand the risks of going home and seems competent to make a decision, you could argue that you should let her go. 
So I understand why someone would say that. I think as clinicians, we generally would be worried about this girl. And as I say, I think the strongest case here would be to say she has a suspected mental disorder and therefore mental health that could apply. Okay, scenario has changed. Her bloods are back, she's got a moderate AKI and she's taken out her cannula and she's refusing a new one and she seems to understand what that's likely to do. Would you force her? Would you somehow coerce or force her to have a cannula and fluids at this point? She's agreed to stay in the department, but she's refusing fluids despite her AKI and recent surgery and overdose and vomiting, understanding that there's risk of significant deterioration in her health. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, okay. Some yeses and some noes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this one's produced quite a mixed reaction here. We've got lots of yeses and lots of noes. Let's see what's in the poll, okay? No, we need the court's agreement is the most common answer. Yes, you can treat her just because you, you think it's in her best interests. Yes, if we have the parents' agreement. Yes, under common law because it's life-saving or life-preserving. Or yes, under the Mental Health Act. Okay, so just to say, um, to, to, to give fluids under the Mental Health Act is quite a difficult thing to do. So the section 5-2, if she was detained to the hospital under that, it wouldn't permit you necessarily to treat her physical health, not unless you could prove that the physical health was caused by the mental disorder that you are there to treat. But even then 5-2 doesn't really give provision for that. The two biggest answer we have here is a yes and no, isn't it? Yes, under common law, because you think it's life preserving, or no, we would need court agreement because she seems to be Gillick competent and asking for something which is potentially very harmful. The safest thing you could do in this situation absolutely would be to have a court agreement. And before that, the scenario hasn't mentioned parents yet, is bring parents in bring family and loved ones and attempt to persuade her and have some agreement. Because if parents agree, look, you should do whatever's needed, then even though she's Gillick competent, that would give your yes under common law answer much more weight if you've got even more people agreeing that it's in this child's best interest and it's life preserving. Okay, I actually need to stop because we've reached the end of time and I've got uh, Meha messaging me there. We didn't quite get to the end of the potential scenarios we had to talk about, but it's such a complex, interesting area. I'm going to pause now. I don't even think we've got time for any more questions, have we? So uh, we might even have to just completely stop there. But I'm really grateful for all your time and engagement, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And amazing slides. I like all the drawings. Is it your own drawing? <laughs> no, actually, all of, all of those pieces of artwork were produced by young people in mental health services, oh. uh, mostly in art therapy. Yeah, that's really amazing. Um, sorry, we're really running out, running out of time, and um, I can see Mr. John Sheath on the screen. But before we go to Mr. Sheath, um, Dr. Hussein, do you want to add anything or say anything? Um, I, I just uh, start by saying thanks so much for actually giving Jeremy and myself this opportunity, and I hope this has been helpful. And I'd like to say, um, I think Jeremy has done the presentation justice. Apologies, I couldn't join on time because of the technical issues. Um, the, the, the highlights, actually, I, I would like to just um, express are, number one, this is very, very, very complex area. And um, it'll, it'll take a, lot, a, lot, a longer so time slot to do it for justice. And number two, someone in the chat had asked about the legal part, and I think we all, all, no matter how senior or junior you are, that's a resource that 
all NHS organizations have. In my view, I think it's underused. And a lot of times when you have these complex cases, always get the backup and check with the, with the department um, so that you know you're, you're covered. So that's an important thing to always remember. No one knows it all. These complexes are very, uh, these cases are complex and they vary so much. So sometimes you, you need, you need the, uh, legal advice and people should remember that. Thank you very much. Um, Jeremy, you can see the amazing feedback you're already receiving. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a very great call. Uh, Jeremy, uh, hi, sorry for interruption, yeah. Maha. Hi, I'm Habab, one of the co-founders of Soft Landing. This is an mm. excellent talk, and I would Actually. be very opportunistic. And I would mm. uh, like I would ask you, kindly ask you if you can record it in, in your own time, the whole presentation, and then we can get it up on our YouTube channel. I think there is a lot of people interested in this talk, and we, we want all to learn in more details about the scenarios. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that would be fine. Okay. Thank I you. think that's a great idea, and I'm sure Jeremy would be happy to be invited back again uh, if there's an opportunity uh, to present this, because I think it's such an important area to, to look into. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Well done. Excellent. Thank you, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. All right. Um, next, we have Mr. John Sheath, who has kindly stepped in um, to cover um, Mrs. Windy Bates, who had the last minute um, engagement. Um, so, Mr. Sheath, um, I think I've emailed you the sort of things that I, I think myself and my other colleagues are thinking about when it comes to complaint and what sort of legal support we expect from from trust and what is the processing of complaints in general when it goes to court. Thank you very much indeed. I uh, apologise for my slightly hoarse voice, so please bear with me. Um, I worked with Wendy for 16 years. We were the uh, trust panel solicitors, so I've also worked with MTW as well as Medway. I know it well. And I want to echo really what the last speaker said. If you're in difficulty, you have a dilemma, please do phone for advice. A lot of what we do, we are a support department, but it's what we call hotline advice. You're there with a the patient, what do I do next? I'm not sure it's mental capacity, mental health, what can I do? We are there and we're, we are uh, greatly underused, I'd say, in that respect. So on to the questions. <clears throat> um, what happens if a patient complains against a doctor who will notify you? What should you do when you receive a complaint? Is the trust legal support always available? And the first thing I want to say is a complaint is legally and within the hospital context, very different from a claim. So a complaint is dealt with by the complaints department. And it might be um, things relating to uh, attitude, bad food, not changing the patient quick enough, all that sort of thing, which are on a lower level to a claim. What we call a claim is breach of duty breach of your standard of duty and the patient or their family is asking for compensation because they think we're negligent. That's a claim. We do get involved in complaints sometimes when the complaints department asks for our help when it's borders on a claim and they don't know whether they should be admitting liability or not. Uh, but for the most part, the trust complaints department We'll get in touch with you. They talk to your consultant and they'll get a statement from you, which has obviously to be factual. Uh, we can help you if you need us to help with a complaint, but the whole complaint system is geared towards resolving complaints. Sometimes it means admitting, yes, we could have done better or done things quicker or whatever, or communicated <clears throat> better is usually one of the issues. So normally the trust legal department don't get involved until there's a claim. And we know about claims some years in advance usually, because the first thing we get is a letter from the patient or their solicitors asking for the records and they're entitled to see the records. And on the form that asks the records, they sometimes put the reason, yes, we think you were negligent because, and then we know there's a potential claim and is listed and logged, but it's not until we get 
what is called a letter of claim that the uh, CNST scheme, Clinical Negligence Scheme for Trusts, comes into play. That is run and organized by the NHS R, NHS resolution. So the state looks after all NHS hospitals when it comes to claim. The CNST scheme is like insurance, but it's actually an indemnity for everything you do as an NHS doctor to an NHS patient. So it covers negligence. It covers every possible angle in that way. And you personally are not going to be worried about indemnity for anything that comes under the umbrella of the CNST scheme. In English law, trusts are what's called vicariously. The umbrella of the trust covers you for every act you do in the course of your employment uh, when you're treating a patient. So you, you can sleep at night. Uh, you haven't got to worry about that aspect. Where it becomes difficult is where perhaps um, something has happened which isn't covered by that scheme, but it's very, very rare. It would have to be something like uh, fraud or dishonesty outside the course of your employment, defamation, uh, medical manslaughter, um, or terrorism. These are crimes, serious crimes, and they're the only things really which the CNST scheme does not cover. So anything you do as a doctor in the hospital to an anxious patient is covered. And I want to reassure you on that. So what happens in a claim? It's a long, long process. Uh, and nowadays, every professional, let alone an uh, professional, will find there are complaints from members of the public or their family, and there are claims about 45% of potential claims never get any further because what happens is we disclose the records, the patient solicitors go to an expert for review and the expert says you haven't got a case. So that's about 45% of the claims never go ahead. It then starts this long process, normally taking one or two years. Sometimes it can be longer or more complex cases where you will be asked to provide a statement. Yes, we help you to prepare the statement. It has to be in your own words, but you can ask us what you should say, what you shouldn't say, how you should phrase it, perhaps, what you should cover. For the most part, statements are factual and based on the records you made at the time. In some cases, you might be asked if there's a particular issue and you've had to exercise your clinical discretion, why you did or didn't do things in a certain way. It might even be why you didn't follow that particular protocol to the letter uh, that day or in that instance for a reason. But most of these claims uh, take some time. So you'll be asked for a statement, statements prepared, it then goes, from the NHSR solicitors, and each trust has a different firm acting for them, who will disclose that statement, which is then passed to the patient's experts. The defence also have experts. And the next stage is that everything's disclosed. It might be everything, and I should warn you, everything you do say in a complaint or a complaint file is disclosable. Whereas things you've said in contemplation of a claim are confidential and not always disclosed. So the statement once written is disclosed. It goes to the experts and then there is an expert meeting. And at that meeting, many claims do not proceed after the meeting because it's not just about breach of duty and whether the standard of care was not met. It's about causation. And did that breach actually cause the injury or was it progression of the illness or some other factor which has caused the injury? So there are many, many hurdles for any family to overcome in a claim. Only 0.3% of all potential claims 
go to trial. It's really, really rare for anyone now to have to appear in a court case in a courtroom uh, on a negligence claim. I will, however, just mention inquests because they are becoming more frequent and you may well be asked to write a statement, which we'll help you with, and to appear in court in an inquest. And we support you, we're in the room with you, we can't tell you what to say, but again, it's accurate what's based on your records. We can tell you what the family issues are and we can represent you in court. And it's important that we do represent you in court. So that's the difference between complaints and claims. I'm gonna look at some other questions now. Um, so um, before we go in, Mr. Sheath, um, I can see a question in the chat, which is also a question I have. Um, um, so if the, the trust legal team will <clears throat> represent you if there are any complaints against you, do you need a private indemnity cover? Not on negligence claims. You might, and exceptionally, we say to the doctor, your version of events is different from the trust version of events. It might be different from what's in the record. It might be different from your colleagues' events. And we have a duty as solicitors to tell you when to get independent representation. That's the time to go to your medical defence organisation, MDU, MBS, there are others, to say, can you help me, please? I'm going to be separately represented. I will give you an extreme example of this. Uh, MTW were charged with corporate manslaughter about five years ago of a lady that did not survive after giving birth. And the anaesthetists were both uh, charged with medical manslaughter and the trust was, trust was charged with corporate manslaughter. In that case, we said the doctors must be separately represented and the trust will be, we will represent the trust because it was a systemic issue, an alleged systemic issue. In fact, the court threw the case out after two weeks of hearing evidence. So it was a happy ending for everybody, but the anaesthetist was separately represented by his union solicitors and the junior doctor um, was also separately represented, uh, but disappeared at the jurisdiction. Uh, he didn't need to. Uh, because the case was thrown out. But there are e extreme cases where we say separate representation. <coughs> Inquest is very rare mm -hmm. <coughs> that you need separate representation unless it's something you don't agree with. It might be the trust serious incident report where you cannot agree with the trust analysis or it differs from your colleague's recollection. But that's really, really rare. For the most part, <coughs> we are there to support the doctors whether it's a claim <clears throat> or an inquest, through the whole process, uh, statements, uh, preparing for the inquest, and uh, and at the inquest during the hearing, we'll be there to help you. Um, and if you have a court case as an international doctor on visa, will that affect your status? It's really unlikely to affect your status. A claim for negligence won't, a complaint won't. The only case a visa is looked at is if there's been non-disclosure when you applied for the visa, or it's something pretty serious, a serious crime in the UK. So I'm not talking motoring offences or things like that. It would be a crime that attracted a more than 12 month prison sentence. It's serious stuff. <clears throat> very, very rare. But as I say, the trust CNSD scheme covers you for all, all that. It won't affect you, uh, your freedom to travel. It won't affect, affect your indemnity policy. Pleading guilty or not guilty only applies to criminal cases. You would in any event have to tell your employer if there's a charge against you. <clears throat> you will be separately represented on your plea and yes the trust hr department might have to look at it and it might be a matter that the gmc has a look at to see if it impinges any way on your clinical competence some do some don't but again it's really really rare 
you had a talk earlier from about the GMC and how few cases uh, actually get there. And that's that's the place where your independent medical defence union can represent you. We do, and I have helped trust doctors when they've been reported to the GMC about NHS cases. So very rare indeed, but exceptionally, a family might take umbrage at something, a, a relative's death, and report that talk to the GMC. And then we've helped the doctor through the process. And often at the first stage, GMC say, look, this is vindictive. It's nothing to do with their clinical competence. And there was a reason for what happened. So we, we will support you all the way. Uh, and your medical events organizations in the background if you need them. They're very good, the MDOs, uh, MDU, I have acted for MDU as well. They provide very good behind the scenes advice and will represent you at GMC if you need it. Um, so private indemnity doesn't need and doesn't cover all your NHS work. You've already got indemnity, but things like defamation and things which come out outside your normal duties uh, in the NHS are covered by the MDO. Um, can you avoid complaints? I think you had a talk on this earlier, but the key I think about complaints is usually communication. Um, and the best way to avoid a complaint and indeed a claim is a good clinical record. Lawyers, judges, courts, look at these records really closely, line by line, word by word. And if you've written a good note at the time, or even retrospectively, we can and do defend claims. I will give an example. We had uh, an inquest about a year ago in the paediatric department of a registrar who took a five-year-old child to a treatment room to try and get IV access because uh, he, he had an infection, nothing much was working. Within minutes of taking him to the room, he had a respiratory arrest. The mother was in the room, the doctor was in the room, uh, the nurse was actually out the room when it happened and the doctor wanted help. She went out the room because she knew the nurse was meeting outside to get help. She didn't press the alarm button 222 arrest until uh, they came back in the room and the nurse pressed it. So at the inquest, there was a, a lot of evidence. Was there delay in treatment? Why had she left the room? Questions of that nature, which were very challenging for her. But she was very honest about it. She said, I thought the best thing I could do for this child was to get some help. I needed extra help. Uh, I did all I could and they masked and bagged. Unfortunately, he had a mucus plug, which could only be removed with an laryngoscope uh, by the anaesthetist and the resus team. So at the inquest, there was an expert who said that the time it took to get help made no difference whatsoever. And the thing that saved the doctor and really supported the trust was the records. The records made by the resus clerk even the switchboard records of when the arrest call first went out, their timings were vital to show when things actually happened. And so there was no comeback, there was no claim. The inquest found that the child died of a very rare uh, but natural cause. And so that's why I say records are all important because they are the contemporaneous evidence which courts look at to show whether you've met the standard of duty or not. Even if you did not, many cases, most cases, are to do with the team. You're not on your own. You've got supervisors, you've got juniors, you've got nurses all helping you, and it's their conduct that's looked at. And even if negligence is found or agreed um, by the NHSR, there is no comeback on you personally. If you have repeated complaints, repeated claims, then obviously someone's going to look to see if you need some help in a particular area or supervision, or it might be, but there's no comeback on you personally. You won't be deported. You are safe.
you can sleep safely in your beds at night and the trust organization is there to wholly support the doctors um, you read about some cases doctors being hung out to dry and all the rest that's not my experience in any trust i've ever worked for or in we support them 100 uh, percent sometimes they say they might need independent advice but we're always there for them being a doctor having a complaint or a claim is part of professional life it can be quite stressful and seeing something in black and white written about your competence when you know it's not true uh, and that's the process we take you through we support you and in all claims you have independent experts who will come in to say that was perfectly acceptable this was a crisis or this doctor was put in that particular situation and could not have done any better or differently uh, and in those cases, we resist the claim. If, however, the expert says, I think something could have been done quicker or sooner or differently, then those cases are usually settled. But it doesn't affect your indemnity premium. It doesn't affect anything at all. It's the trust who are responsible for everything you do under their roof. Um, that's very reassuring good <laughs> i hope it is uh, what other roles the trust legal team well we advise as i say hotline advice quite a lot the phone call 24 7 we have a hotline uh whether to withdraw treatment can we restrain the patient do we have to go to court those sorts of things and um, can a doctor complain against a patient Yes, doctors can and frequently do. Uh, obviously, if patients abusing you or their family, we do all we can to protect you. Uh, nowadays, with social media, sometimes there's stuff online that we uh, have to get removed. Uh, and in a claim, you can counterclaim as a trust about the patient. The patient's saying we are negligent, but we often say, well, the patient didn't follow our advice. The patient wasn't complying at all. We explained to the patient what not having the treatment would mean and the outcome unfortunately happened. So we can counterclaim in a case patients have to take responsibility for their actions as well as the trust and the doctors and all the medical duties we have. Um, so I think I've covered most of your points, but I'm very happy to answer any questions or any further points you have. Um, so I can see one question in the chat and it's asking about the records that you're looking at. So if you have handwritten a note and then you sort of dictated a note like a computer note, do you look at both notes or, or the, the handwritten or at, at that time note over sort of overcome the retrospective notes, if I've got the question correctly? You have. Um... We're in a sort of transition between electronic and patient written records. So normally a written record written at the time will have greater prominence in a lawyer's mind as to what happened at the time, but are clearly written retrospective manuscript or electronic record is really important. It's fine if the manuscript note matches the electronic record. If there's any difference after the event because of hindsight, uh, that can then be a problem because it'll be say, well, that's inconsistent with the note at the time. But often people reflect or write a note later to say this is, and it's a good thing they do. This is what happened. This is what I was told. This is what I knew. This is who I called. Uh, and it's a very helpful note because as I said, these cases can take years. You won't remember two years later when asked to repeat exactly what happened, who was there, uh, what was said. So all contemporaneous notes are really important, whether written or electronic. It doesn't really matter, but better to write a note than no notes. And other notes will back you up now. Timings, electronic notes, um, all the notes we do now with uh, technology are really, really important and much more precise than the old written notes, which were always challenged by, aha, this was written after the event. 
uh, many of them weren't, but that was the problem. So it is possible that uh, not everything's written down and the doctor will then have to explain in a statement or in court uh, what is the uh, explanation for what we did. Because you can't write in a note your full reasons for doing something or why something happened. Often your hands on and there's no time to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. That's a very comprehensive answer. Um, well, someone from the audience is saying they will cancel their private indemnity. <laughs> I don't think this is something we would we would necessarily sort of encourage, but we, we just re rely on facts. I wouldn't, I wouldn't cancel your private indemnity because it covers other things that NHS indemnity covers, but mm -hmm. You know, 99% is covered by the CNST scheme, but you might be defamed. You might have a problem, um, some other claim against your charge outside your work place of work where the MDU will help you. And if there's ever a GMC referral, they will certainly help you. And and if, if, if the trust is going to represent you in a certain case, does the indemnity get involved in top, on top of the trust or you only get them involved if you need them to? Um, in an inquest or anything like that, the trust will represent you regardless. Mm -hmm. In a claim, the trust will represent you unless there's what's called a conflict of interest. So as I said, if, if a doctor's version of events was completely different to their colleagues, uh, we would say be separate, go and be separately represented. It doesn't mean to say the indemnity is not covered because it still might be something done in the course of your duties. But if, say, a doctor totally ignored hospital protocol, went against what they were asked to do by a superior, that sort of case, then the indemnity might not cover. But they're extremely rare. I mean, really rare. And often, even when the protocol is not covered, there are reasons why it wasn't either timing or there is a clinical, good clinical reason why we didn't follow precisely what the guidelines said. So, uh, as I say, rest assured, the CNST scheme is a really comprehensive scheme and covers uh, permanent staff, locums, uh, bank staff, and agency staff, anyone that works under the roof of the hospital uh, treating a patient. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mr. Sheath. Um, I think someone is asking about the 24-7 the contacts, but I think that depends on individual trust. Yep, get in touch with your trust department. Uh, they all now have a mobile number for out-of-hours calls. Your Each department should know what it is. Um, it used to be my mobile phone number in the middle of the night, but now it's on a rotor. And what happens is someone will triage as they do your problems, uh, whether the case needs immediate urgent treatment, in which case, yes, we can. And I have got the judge out of bed on occasion to say, this is urgent. Next two hours, this is going to happen. We need authority to do something, treat the patient, etc. Other treatments like withdrawal of treatment are generally elective over a longer period of time, but we do and can get the judge in the middle of the night if need be. We have an arrangement with specialist council chambers in London who phone up the clerk to the judge who literally will get the judge nowadays online. We speak to them over Zoom or Teams and make our application and explain to the judge why we need their help. So it can and does happen. Amazing. That's all new to me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Sheath. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and we'd love to have you in our future events as well. That was very informative. Right. Well, just thank you too for the opportunity. <clears throat> I've had three children born at uh, Tumbridge Wells Hospital. Two were premature. And I can't praise you enough for all the good work you do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so it's break time. <clears throat> Isn't it, yeah, we'll be back at uh, five. Is it twelve twenty-five? Twenty-five. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's a bit of a longer break. We're sorry, we don't have a lunch break. It's just because it's a short day. Um, but we have only two more sessions and.
and then you can go and have a big lunch break. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'll just bug you again about the uh, pre-event survey. That would be really, really helpful for us if you can please um, fill it if you haven't done so. And we'll see you at 12.25.
Right. I hope you enjoy your break. Um, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Stuart Jones. Uh, he is head of Pals at uh, Tunbridge Wales Hospital, and he will talk to us about what happens when patients complain. It's over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, I think I have a, quite a job um, following those other uh, presentations, um, so I'll do my best. Bear with me. Um, usually I've got quite an informal approach to speaking about this. I'm really happy to take questions as well. Today, a little bit, a little bit about my organisation, what it offers, and then move on to a particular focus around how you may feel when you get a complaint and the sort of support that an organisation like mine might be able to offer you or others who are going through a complaint might be able to offer you. So if we can just get into the next slide, and I'll talk a little bit about practitioner health. Now, if we are live, I'd ask for a show of hands about who's heard of practitioner health, but obviously that's not going to work on a screen. So I'm going to hope that many of you have heard of the service, and I'm going to go, go with the objective that if you haven't heard about the service, that you will know all about us by the end of today, and you'll be able to spread the word to at least one or two of your colleagues in the future. So Practitioner Health has been around for about 15 years now, and we are a confidential service, mental health service. Just if we just go back for one moment to the previous slide. Confidential mental health service for health and care professionals who are suffering with some sort of mental health issue or possibly an addictions issue. And predominantly we see doctors, about 90% of the people that come through, just going to close a curtain, it's very sunny in here um uh 90 of the people who come through are actually doctors but we do see other healthcare professionals as well where there might be a barrier to them accessing confidential care um so we see some nurses some people in management roles uh, paramedics etc cetera, etc cetera, where there's also a barrier for them in terms of accessing care but predominantly doctors and our job overall is to try and get you well try and get you back to work um and hope that you continue working in the health service because you're a really vital asset and nobody wants to lose you so that's kind of what we're all about really if we go to the next slide just the headlines so as i said 15 years we've seen around 30,000 people during that time um we've currently got around six and a half thousand people on our books so about five percent of the medical workforce currently is with practitioner health um so just for you to recognize that if you're having a tough time right now you're probably not the only one. Um, it's not unusual for us to be seeing significant numbers, registering sort of six, 650, 700 people a month who are struggling in one way or another with their mental health. So a really kind of busy service um, and we're covering all of England, all of Scotland. So if you're in any of those two countries, you're eligible to access the service. There is a sister service, if any of you are in Wales, called Canopy. Unfortunately, in Northern Ireland, there isn't currently a service available to you, but we're working very hard to try and get that set up. What do we do? Um, next slide. Um, we are a mental health treatment service, so we will be offering a full assessment, trying to work out how we can help you best. And that's usually a sort of 60 to 90 minute appointment that really gives you an opportunity to talk about how you're feeling. It might be the first time you've ever shared with anybody kind of what's going on in your mental health and the anxieties and the stresses and the concerns that you have. And then following that, we'll come up with a treatment plan. Now, that might be ongoing case management with one of our clinicians who are predominantly either GPs with a special interest in mental health or psychiatrists or nurses um, with qualifications in mental health. So you might continue to be case managed and seen on a regular basis by them. They might prescribe medication to um, help you with your pathway. They might identify that therapy, either on an individual basis or group basis, could be useful to you. And they might also, if you've got an addiction problem, be looking at what sort of detox and rehab process we can offer you. And we have access to three units around the country um, that can offer that sort of support. Um, we'll work with your organisation if you're involved in a complaint. We'll support you as much as we can with OH and making adjustments for you to uh, be able to attend appointments and things. So we'll really try and do what we can to, to get you well and get you back. 
Now I'm going to talk about complaints a little bit now. So yeah, thank you for flicking to this slide. Um, it is inevitable at one point in your career that you are going to get a complaint. It's not a when, it's, it's not an if rather, it's a when. Most people at some stage in their career will get a complaint. And it might be a nothing complaint. Our medical director got a complaint that her bum was too big. What are you gonna do? Um, but you know, it could be a ridiculous complaint. It could be a, a vexatious complaint or it could be a genuine complaint. And actually it doesn't matter which it is because it all feels pretty horrible when it happens. Um, Sometimes a complaint will lead to a formal investigation internally within the organisation, and sometimes it will lead to uh, involving the regulators. Now, what I would say to you is if you're getting to the stage with your mental health where you feel like you're, um, you're starting to lose patience with patients, you know, not a very good way of expressing it, but perhaps that you're um, level of tolerance is slowing down, that could be a sign that you're starting to get burnt out. So I would say to you, before you get that incident that involves a complaint, but you're starting to feel like your tolerance level is reducing, that might be a sign that your mental health needs some support. So that's the point when you might be wanting to come to us. And we will not share anything that you tell us that's been going on in your mental health with anybody unless we think that you are a danger to yourself or to others. So if we thought that you were on the verge of suicide, for example, we would have a responsibility to involve the police um, if we thought that you were actually making active plans and had a, a significant plan to, to take your own life. Or if we thought that you were a danger to your family for some reason um, because of a decision. But those are really, really rare that we have to do that. Occasionally, we might think that you need to make yourself known to the regulator because you've done something that breaches good medical practice. But often, if you're seeking treatment with us, the regulator doesn't want to get involved. So this memorandum of understanding that I've got up on the screen here is a special agreement that allows us as a service to have an anonymized discussion with the regulator and say, Dr. X has come to us, they've told us this is what's been going on, um, they've told us um, these issues, we are going to treat them in this way, they are going to take a period of time off work, let's say while they start their medication, while they start their therapy, we don't think there are any risks to patients, we think with treatment they're going to recover. In most cases, the regulator isn't going to want to get involved in that type of situation because you are seeking help, you're following advice, and the problem is likely to resolve. And so it's very unlikely that a regulator would want to get involved. And all of that will be done on an anonymized basis and no names will be shared. Um, so I think it's a really important part of explaining kind of what we have within the service. So if we can move on a slide, um, I want to talk about, and when I say how do patients involved in investigations or complaints react, I'm talking about you guys. If you come to us, you become our patient. So we're caring for you. You are the patient in this scenario. And as I said, it is likely that most of you will get a complaint at some stage in your career. And it's true that for the majority of people, that first notification that they've had a complaint is a shock. It's usually possible a once or twice, or if you're unlucky, maybe three times in a career event. And it's horrible. And, it, it, you know, it, for the complaints managers, and I, and I think, you know, the talk just now was absolutely fabulous. They are used to dealing with this day in, day out. It's their bread and butter, and they really know what they're doing. But for you, it will be rare that you get a complaint. And so it will feel like a shock. And you may well feel quite distressed. And the first thing I would say to you when you get a complaint is don't do anything, is just sit back, let think about it. Don't suddenly start writing your report. Don't suddenly start responding in writing to your supervisor, your clinician, the PALS team, whoever. Just take some time and think about it. Um, often you'll be told, I need a report by tomorrow morning. You, uh, you've had the timescales presented to you just now. What you need is a, a timescale for saying sorry, 
but we don't necessarily need that time scale for your report. So take some time to write the report slowly. Once you've written it, get somebody else to read it. That's really important. If you have a defence organisation, get them to read it or get a colleague to read it because that immediate kind of anger, resentment that you're feeling, well, how dare they complain about me? I did my best. I'm working under terrible circumstances um, can come out in your report and you don't need that to be in there. Um, what you also don't need is feeling guilty. And lots of people start feeling, oh my God, it's all my fault. I could have done so much more. And all of that comes out in the report as well. So, you know, I, I once um, drank somebody else's milk from the fridge 25 years ago, confessing to every you know little thing you've ever done. And, and we see that often in reports that people say, oh, I really should have done this. And also I didn't shut the door properly. And also I didn't press this button. And also I didn't this and also I didn't that. And none of it matters. So again, that kind of over guilt and shame and sort of overreaction to getting a complaint. So I would say, take a deep breath, go home, think about it, talk to family and friends, talk to somebody that can support you, get somebody else to read your report. Um, it's very, very important to not react straight away. Um, it is a traumatic thing, um, as I say, but often um, people can feel very lost and not really know where they're going with this. And if we can just move to the next slide, I want to give you some comments that some of the people in our patient group who have been involved in complaints have um, fed back to us about kind of how they felt in those, both those initial moments of getting the complaint, but also um, once they were going through an investigation process and, and the outcomes of that investigation process. So, you know, that feeling of feeling, you know, utter shock and what on earth did this mean? Am I going to lose my career? Is it a catastrophe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so having some support, having some people around you, have, talking to people that maybe have gone through a complaint themselves and have come out the other side of it is really, really important. And it's OK to feel upset that you got a complaint because you were probably doing your utmost, your absolute best. And it's quite right that you would feel upset when you would be having that, uh, you know, all of that work and you're doing your best and, and still you weren't able to give the patient what they needed. Um, Maha touched on that kind of idea of it impacting on your sense of identity as well as a doctor. And that's something that's really, really common um, that people do feel like it's an attack on their medical self. Um, you've worked, you've studied, you've put in long hours all these years, and yet somebody is now questioning whether you have the right to be called a doctor, especially if this complaint is going through some sort of investigation process through the regulator. It's a pretty nasty process at the best of times. Um, and often we kind of liken this whole process to a form of bereavement. It's as much taking away your identity and your sense of self as it might be losing somebody that's so important in your life. The next slide, um, what are we going to be doing at Practitioner Health if you come to us? Can we just move on? Thank you. Um, and what are we going to be thinking about in relation to you as a patient? So we're going to be quite concerned about you if you've had a complaint. Um, Partly it's going to be kind of if you've understood what's happened um, and how, what your attitude to it is. Partly it's going to be if you have had the opportunity to share it and talk to somebody about what's going on. Your age and your level of training, we're going to be thinking about that. Do you have support structures around you? Are you still in a training post um, or are you working independently? We're going to be thinking about your, yeah, your level of responsibility that you work at. We're certainly going to be looking at how well you are currently. So this is not about your fitness to practice long term. This is about whether you should actually be at work right now. And one of the most important things sometimes is just to take a period of absence and to be signed off for work. And we can do that very, very easily. We can sign you off work for a short period whilst we get you started on medication or started in therapy or get you attending our group. Um, and support you. So we will certainly be looking at whether we think you should be at work right now. Um, and also we'll be looking at, um, you know, is there anything in the way of addiction cases? Because that's when you start to fall foul of regulatory stuff. Now, it doesn't always mean that you're going to get me um, hauled up in front of the regulator, as I've explained, but it's something that's going to be needed to take into consideration. Um, 
the regulators will take the view often that if, again, if you're in treatment, if you're getting treatment, and if you become well as a result of treatment, that they don't want to get involved in addiction cases unless there's been something like theft from a ward of medication or the like. But certainly for anybody who's got a complaint, we will be wanting to think about suicidality and we will want to think about what support do we put around you to make sure that you're OK. Um, long term implications for people that have been involved in complaints, even if it's not proven. So there are many complaints that um, Stuart alluded to now that are nonsense complaints that he makes him want to bang his head against a brick wall, as he said. There are many that don't go anywhere that are, you know, investigated thoroughly and nothing happens as a result of it. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't impact on you, the doctor at the heart of the complaint. And we do know and we see quite commonly people coming to us after they've been through a complaint process, feeling quite scarred by it all and saying that it has impacted on their ability to practice. Um, and to continue working. So we do find that people are ashamed, they're embarrassed, um, that their values have been attacked in some way, that they're scared to continue practicing medicine. So again, we can offer treatment around that, we can offer therapy around that. So if that's something that you recognize in yourself, we'd be more than happy to have you come and register with the service and we can explore with you how you can get your confidence back, how you can recreate that kind of sense of self and values that you had as a doctor. We do know that doctors going through a complaint often are quite isolated, so just skipping back a little second, um, and that anxiety and depression are key in people that are going through complaints. And we do know that people are really, really scared that if they do go through a complaint and they're suspended, that it will impact on their long term career, particularly if they're a training post. So some of the things that we can do, thank you for the next slide, um, will be to offer a variety of different um, resources and supports. So on our website, we have this uh, navigation guide, which is you can look at whether you're registered with the service or not, but it will talk you through all those different stages of when a complaint comes in, when people are gathering information, the, the process of the investigation and the hearing, what happens when a decision is made, if you are suspended, what you might want to do about remediation, getting back to practice, and if you are suspended or erased, what could you be doing instead? How do you put those skills into place? We also have um, a number of um, different resources like our suspended practitioners group, so you can come and talk to other people who are going through processes. Um, and we've got a variety of other kind of signposting and resources, which I, I won't go through in great detail. I'm realizing I'm running out of time. Um, <laughs> um, Maha, do tell me to shut up if you need me to stop. But just some of the things that you can do for yourself. I think make sure you've got a good support structure around you. If you don't have friends and family in this country, um, think about where that support can come from. Can you talk to colleagues? Can you do you have a faith? Can you do this through your own faith, your church, your temple, whatever you might have? Make sure you're getting proper guidance. You're not making decisions alone. Talk to your defence organisation or talk to a supervisor or talk to somebody that's been through this. Think about um, how you're going to share this with people that need to know. You might be feeling embarrassed um, and that's perfectly normal. But think about kind of how you there are people that are going to need to know what's happened and how you're going to do that. Don't go on social media. Um, don't comment on social media. Don't engage with what people are saying if this is a media interest case just keep away from it um, take those apps off your phone do whatever you need to do and just take it day by day focus on where you want to get to um, my final slide is just some advice from patients of ours who've been through this so if you are going through this and it looks bleak don't give up hope think about kind of where you want to get to um, it's it's quite natural to be feeling bitter and, and disillusioned by this and, you know, but it's happened and you just have to kind of move on and get back to where you want to be. So, you know, things can only get better. So just take it day by day and see where you go. That's a very, very quick run through because I realised the time was short. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Wanda. That was really interesting. And I think this is what people wanted to sort of end the day because I feel more relaxed after going through all the complaints and 
um, where you can find support and, and it's natural and normal to, to, you know, to feel horrible about it. But knowing there is a support out there is, is you know, is sort of reassuring. And um, I would definitely say 